the stupid advice is really just to say like, be a good business and demonstrate that it's a good business. I think, I think the like biggest, especially like earlier stage mistake that I see is that, and, and I think this comes from reading a lot of like TechCrunch articles about companies that get founded or like invested in, in, in big dollars sometimes too, before there's even a product. I, my guess is that almost never happens in education in particular, and that it's actually just pretty rare generally. Most of the time you actually have to be generating revenue before you can raise money. And the articles in the media just don't, don't really like focus there. And so I would really say like, focus on your own business and what you can do without outside investment. This episode of the EdTech Startup Show is brought to you by EduHustles. That's www.eduhustles.com. EduHustles is a place where teachers can go to find out about part-time education-related side hustles that they can do using their existing skills and experience. And over my about 10 years of teaching, I've done every education-related side hustle from running a club to tutoring to working for an online teaching company to doing consulting, blogging, freelancing. And I realized that lots of other teachers were lo uh, looking for these same kinds of opportunities and also looking to learn about how to get started with this stuff. So if you are an educator, an administrator even, or just curious to see what it's all about, go to www.eduhustles.com, drop your email in there, and introduce yourself when you get the message from me. Also, if you're an education company and you want to talk to me about hiring teachers for education-related part-time jobs, you can reach out to me at gerard at gerarddawson.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by the five-day copy fix. I've been a teacher for about 10 years, as I've mentioned, and I've helped, fortunately, some of the bigger K-12 edtech companies in America fix their website, emails, content, case studies, etc. by doing one thing, and that's improving the copy. After thinking about what I've learned, mistakes I've made, different techniques and tactics and strategies I've tried, I put it all together for you. And for you, I'm talking about folks working in marketing or founders of education companies or ed tech startups, or even a solo education consultant. And I put it together for you in a short five-day free email course, which, like I mentioned, is called the five-day copy fix. Now, it's not a magic bullet. It's not going to magically transform your business. However, if you read the five lessons, think carefully about how they apply to your specific business situation, and most importantly, apply the ideas, I think you'll see some surprising improvements. So if you were curious to see what it's all about, go to GerardDawson.com. And right on the front page there, you'll see a form to drop in your email and get lesson one. So put in your email, hit the big button, and once you get that first lesson, please hit reply, introduce yourself, and let me know what you think. This is the EdTech Startup Show, and I'm your host, Gerard Dawson. Tonight, I'm here with Mike Tang who is the CEO and founder of Swing Education. Mike, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, for sure. Great. Thanks for having me. Sure. So, Mike, the basically kind of the one sentence overview of, of Swing is that you're, you're working to help solve schools pain points or problems around substitute teacher scheduling and placement. I know, you know, even recently you've gotten into doing doing some new things uh, as well. So yep. just in your words, it's always better to hear from the, from the CEO. 
what, you know, tell me about Swing and, and your role there. Yeah, so I'm Mike, I'm the co-founder CEO of Swing Education, and we help schools and districts find and schedule substitute teachers. And then, you know, you alluded to, I haven't actually worked out a way to add this into the one sentence thing, but we also are now doing tutoring too. So the same teachers that are in our class classrooms are offering tutoring directly to students too. And that's something that we started to do after the COVID-19 shelter in place orders. Yeah, and that's, that's something I'm, I'm fascinated in because I know right now there's tons of people with teaching credentials or interests in education, like maybe a, a past career as a teacher or they've taken a break. And there's a lot of people who just, you know, are looking to basically earn a partial living or supplement their income as a substitute teacher. So I want to dive into your little bit of your background, the background of the company, but you know, you're obviously through being a practitioner, you're an expert in this area of kind of employment trends or substitute teaching trends in education. So I'm wondering, thinking back, what did you see or notice in terms of maybe, you know, statistics or just insight or observation that kind of gave you that spark to think of, this is a problem that, that needs to be solved? It was, it was probably like none of those things. I mean, it was actually just, I was head of technology at a charter school called Rocket Ship Education. And I, I did a bunch of things over five years there, and largely instructional technology. So a lot of blended learning initiatives, working on grants with the Gates Foundation, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, you know, bringing online learning programs to kids and about four years in, um, the director of recruitment at Rocketship, Denise Leung, actually just asked me to help her with managing and logistics and coordination of substitute teachers. And so I started helping out with it. Oz and Asha, who are now my two co-founders and high school friends of mine, they started helping me with this. Like they actually were just un- recently unemployed and quit their jobs and didn't weren't doing their next thing yet. And so they started basically volunteering to help me with my nonprofit work. And as we started to dig into this problem, started talking to neighboring schools and districts, just realized at that point that every school district has some issues with fill rates of substitute teachers in particular. Obviously closely behind that is kind of quality of substitute teachers and experience in the classroom. And so what they, they kind of convinced me, I guess, actually, that it was something that I should leave my uh, nonprofit job to do. So was there a period where you were doing both at once? Yeah. So I was still head of technology at Rocketship and was kind of working on this as a problem for Rocketship for my work too, but then also kind of working on with Oz and Asha on it on the side, but then doing a whole bunch of other things at Rocketship too. And it was actually like at some point, because Oz and Asha were not working at the time, they sort of came to me and presented the facts, laid it out that it was probably not particularly fair that I was earning a full-time income somewhere and they weren't. And that made sense. And I mean, like, they basically were like, look, we can all do this together or we'll just go find another work. It wasn't like a a painful thing. It wasn't really like an ultimatum in, in a bad sense. It just was like facts. We were all married. Oz had kids at the time. Now we all have kids, but yeah. Got it. So it was a relatively smooth transition from doing both to, to making the leap. Yeah, it was. And you know, there were like, it was time. I had been there five years. That was the longest I'd ever worked anywhere. It was an incredible job. It was super fun working at rocket ship, everything that I like wanted it to be when I left software engineering. Yes. And I, I've, I've seen you write about it a little bit, the, kind of the value of a founder having education coming from you know, the place of being working in a school. So right. that's cool that you, you know, have, that's part of your story as well. So I know relatively, you know, early in your, in the company's career, you were part of Imagine K-12, which is now Y Combinator. Right. And if you don't mind, I want to share, you, you wrote in, I guess it was Ed Week uh, Market yeah. Brief about the experience a little bit. And so here's, I'll try to get it right. Here's a quote from your, your article. You said, it was about advice. And I know so many people 
in the startup world are are looking for advice and in particular i think in education because if you're not from the world of education but you want to build a a startup in education there's all these unknowns and mysteries or kind of things that you don't know about until you experience anyway your your quote was the value in advice even negative advice is to make you stop and think if you find yourself saying they are wrong and they don't understand the context of your product then maybe you are wrong so i thought that was really cool just kind of about self awareness and maybe even your ego so i'm wondering in the kind of the life cycle of your company if you've ever had any of those experiences where you basically had a, an assumption or a, a, a belief about either the product or the marketing or how to operate that, that you had to kind of question and then change your mind about? Yeah. I mean, I think any entrepreneur that's been at it for long enough would tell you like, absolutely. There's so many things, so many things I've been wrong about. And luckily I think there's, it seems like we have no shortage of people at swing that want to tell me when I'm wrong, which is a good thing. And maybe in particular, my two co-founders, we all like to be right for sure. The things that stick out to me, I would say were, and like, I think they stick out because I was probably a little bit, more adamant about like continuing down this, you know, what ended up being a wrong path in the face of like, call it criticism or disagreement from my co-founders. And the two things that stick out were one, I think originally we had thought like we'd build all this software first, get the software kind of out there to help districts manage their substitute teacher pools. And then we would like use that as the original kind of demand side of this marketplace. So the goal was always to build kind of more of a marketplace where you would have substitute teachers and schools. But we thought that the better way to kind of jumpstart things would be to get software out there and then you'd have demand kind of built in. And, you know, we, we spent like an entire summer and maybe, and then some like before the summer talking to potential customers, school districts, charter schools, private schools about basically taking our software for free and using it to manage their substitute teacher pools. And we would say like, you know, you can use the software for free. You're already paying for software. You can just stop using that. How great is that? And everyone was like, that's okay. Like, <laughs> like it would, you're, they would kind of say like, it, it might be better than what we're doing now and it would be cheaper, but like, it's just not like one of our top three problems say like, it's just not like the problem that like, people complain about isn't really the software to manage the substitute teacher pool per se. It's really about like, we just don't have enough. Like if you have an 80% fill rate, one in five times that you're asking for a substitute teacher, you're not getting one. Um, and 80% sounds good, but one in five missing subs does not sound good. And so, and the whole time, like through this three, four month period or whatever it was, I had my co-founder Asha kind of being like, don't you think we should just recruit some substitute teachers like to be a part of our swing pool? And, uh, you know, eventually I was kind of like, I think I like remember kind of this moment and it's not so vivid, but I definitely have this feeling of like, we were leaving a customer meeting and having, and like having myself just kind of be like, yep, I think now's the time. <laughs> You're right, Asha. Like I probably should have realized that two and a half months ago, maybe longer. And so there's that. And the other one I would say is like a similar kind of pricing thing is we originally sort of started by having the, the pricing be what we call budget neutral to school districts. Like let us deal with whatever the ramifications might be with substitute teachers, like eating the cost. And it turns out school districts didn't, they didn't like that. And substitute teachers definitely would not have liked that. Although at the time we basically just weren't operating that way. And so eventually what we found is that by charging the school districts and not charging the substitute teachers, it was actually like better for everybody. The school districts actually felt better about it. It aligned better with how they wanted to operate. They didn't really have a problem with the additional fees. And so again, like, it's just like, even from a school district operator standpoint, that was something that I had to learn about kind of the cultural values of school districts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, and that just kind of helped refine more or less your your offer, I guess, to yeah the districts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it helped us like communicate so much better with them and understand where, not just where their pain points really were, but also like how they wanted to address them. 
and I, I think it, it really paid off in terms of like, oh, like you really got to listen to people, even if, and, and it's such a fine line and like balancing act between sort of this like attitude of be the change you want to be, you know, you want to see in the world uh, versus like, oh, like you still have to, especially in education probably, work within the like, confines of really an industry that's pretty slow to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned just one thing there that I want to just kind of spark my curiosity. I was talking to a few weeks ago on a past episode, Lauren, Lauren DeShiel, who is mm -hmm. the founder of uh, Nimble, another yeah. people-related company in, right. in K-12. And, you know, one topic that you just mentioned, which I talked to her a little bit about, and I'm curious of, of your opinion on too, is what it's, what it's like to more or less have, you know, not have to, but as a requirement for your business, interact with the, the district level people for making sales. So yeah. I'm curious, just general, your, your take on that, what you've learned, maybe advice for somebody who's, you know, earlier in the path of, of doing that. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged thing. Like having, you know, in air quotes to, to interact with the districts. And, and this is strictly from a business standpoint, like it's actually better if you can sell quickly, right? Like the interesting thing is like, it, there's, there's actually just, I mean, total kind of like rules of thumb that end up being very, very hard to break around size of sales and like how much you can spend to do those sales. And so if you're selling school by school and only making, I don't know, call it single digit thousands, like four digit, uh, like account values per school, it's probably ultimately just going to be too expensive to have like an outside salesperson, somebody that's willing to go meet with each of those accounts, schools. And so you sort of, if you're going to hire outside sales, you have to do it at the district level. And we don't have a choice because um, usually substitute teachers is a thing that's managed at the districts. And at the same time, we tend to have pretty fast sales cycles because of the value proposition, because we're not asking for major commitments. And frankly, because like we have a service that they want to continue to come back and use. We've got super high retention rates. And so that all works in our favor. So like to go from a meeting with an assistant superintendent to not just a signed contract, but actually like them having issued a request and had a substitute teacher. Uh, for us, that's about a three month period where I think a lot of times if you talk to education companies, they'll cite, you know, district sales seven or eight months, like on a best case, and maybe as long as 18 months or longer, if you're like in the assessments world where like a state, like Texas is like every five years, we'll look at it like all right, like that could be a really long sales cycle. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of dinners that you're taking some superintendent <laughs> out to or whatever. And so like, you know, I think it's like, I'm happy to do district sales as long as they continue to be efficient. But it, you can certainly get kind of stuck. Districts, I, I think what I found is that they, they just have, and, and this is true of all education organizations, CMOs, despite how efficient I think they would like to say they are, there's just like a cultural value, I think, in education that makes decision making very consensus driven. And so you can end up having, like, call it a majority of people that want to do something, but like one or two detractors within a district building can kind of cause something to just stop. And so we've been pretty fortunate to mostly have avoided that substitute teachers. Again, it's just kind of like a, a problem that runs across departments and that most, most people feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, the more, the more it also, ha yeah, you said it across departments and then really at all stakeholder levels of yes. education. So for yeah. example, you know, if we look at kind of a worst case scenario to best case, I'm a high school English teacher. So if, you know, there was a district, let's say in, I don't know, some state, Maryland, where they needed to better ha handle substitute teachers. And one kid had no substitute teacher for, I don't know, three days over the course of two weeks. You know, the parent, the colleagues, the yep. principal, and, you know, with a parent email or phone call all the way up to school administrators could 
feel that as you're as you're yeah. kind of saying. Totally, yeah. And, and like, you know, I this is like a very common problem in ed tech, especially with like call it certain curriculum products, but also like products that are like teacher tools. And like you've probably used these as a teacher sometimes where like you're excited about something, but the kind of uh, momentum at the district level to like buy that product for the district is, is just not there. The district office doesn't feel the same pains on a day-to-day -day basis that like a teacher does and vice versa is true too. Like I don't wanna make it that like one party is like more important than the other. And so it just ends up being like, yeah, like there's a misalignment there, which makes it hard to get kind of the, the dollars out the door to that particular company, even if it's a good product. Mm -hmm. Right, right. This is, yeah, this is unique in that, in that way. So I am, I've been really fascinated just with the, you know, to people maybe outside of education or, or schools, the substitute teacher just seems like something, you know, you've, you've been through like, maybe a decade or so ago, you know, kids would go in, they put on a movie or whatever. It's just like, right. you know, yay, we have a sub. But I have been interested just as, you know, various changes happen in education, how the, and, you know, employment in general has become a more fluid thing yeah. and people are changing careers um, about the either expanded or redefined version of the, the substitute teacher. And it's kind of like on demand, more of like an on-demand teacher workforce what, what do you see about you know the current status of you know this idea and, and maybe how it could or or could possibly play out in the future yeah i mean you know you mentioned like whether or not some of those trends around human capital generally but then also in education like how they played into us starting or growing the company and i, I think like you know, I was sort of like, well, it was mostly just like, it, it seemed like a problem that we wanted to solve. But I definitely do think that there is this macro trend around, I mean, I, I guess, on demand workforce and like that human capital in general is a little harder to manage. Like you don't have people like younger workers that come out of college and think to my think to themselves like, okay, the job I get that starts this summer is going to be the one that I'm going to have for 35 years. And that's just not normal. People like employment is so much more fluid and that runs across industries. And, you know, I, I would say that the notion and so many of the benefits, especially retirement benefits for, for unionized teachers is like really incentivizing people to try and stay within, within a district or state at least for 15, 20, 25 years. I think in California, CalSTRS doesn't pay out that max benefit till you've worked somewhere for 20 or 25 years, maybe 30. I'm not totally sure, but like, it's a long time. Mm -hmm. And again, much longer than most kind of like new grads see. And I think like what we've been able to see is that there are a lot of people, we call them EDU explorers, that like don't, aren't ready out of college to make that kind of a commitment to, to teaching. And we're happy to kind of help them explore the career, help them explore the classroom. I think of ourselves as being the cheapest, easiest way to get into the classroom and gain teaching experience. And so that's just like one of the ways. And I mean, frankly, I, like I always do, this is not as relevant today, but like to go get your credential, even the substitute teacher permit that in California, it's called the 30 day emergency teaching credential. The CTC, and, and this is just them being under-resourced, like oftentimes it takes them two and a half, three months to process someone's paper application. It's a long time. I mean, like, and, and like in a world where you have a shortage of teachers, it feels really awful that the system is set up in a way where you can't get there quickly. Those same people might have only one be had that passion for, you know, trying to get into the classroom for this, like, two day period and you really want to like take advantage of that. And we've found ways to work with county offices of education here in California in particular to get people those credentials in one or two days, certainly within a week. And so that's like, again, something pretty exciting that I think we've been able to do to, to just capture at least the demand for teaching that is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I want to talk about the, the new, I guess, arm or direction for, yeah. for swing with swing tutors. I, I have one last quick question, just from what yeah. you're, a lot of what you're saying is kind of opening up more, more thoughts for me. 
you, you mentioned California there and the, the credentialing process. I'm in New Jersey where it's a little bit different. And, yep. you know, as I talk to, for example, people from, you know, Australia, Canada, Europe, and they ask about kind of like similarities across the states. And I tell them, you know, there's 50 different education <laughs> yeah. systems, basically. And that's been, you know, something on my mind. And I, I'm wondering yeah. for you where then the, you know, that's even like the, you know, peak bureaucracy kind of is, is like the credentialing uh, process. I, I'm wondering yeah. about your experience navigating the various states. Yeah, it's it's a challenge for sure. I I think though 50 states, <laughs> maybe this is a startup, a startup way of looking at it, but like, I was like, oh, it could be worse. You could be doing things at like the city level or a district level, and you're typically not. Like if we have to go through the bureaucracy, call it for, for 50 states, it's actually not too bad in my opinion. And the, like, I think we've gotten pretty good at it. You know, we, we chose from a mission standpoint, because like, education and helping k-12 in the u.s is really like as of about 10 years ago all i wanted to do with my career like not i'm not gonna do anything else and so this is the industry and like for better or worse take it or leave it this is what we do as a company and i, I think we've gotten used to it and are pretty good at it we try and build those relationships honestly like with new jersey like in the doe office so that we have contacts that we can use to get things done and and frankly like I would say the strategy is something like get on a plane, go to New Jersey, go knock on some doors in the DOE office and, and, and talk to some people and like, let them know like, Hey, we're, we're really here trying to help. Like, you know, the almost any question, like, you know, you ask questions in a way where you know the answers and you know that you, it aligns us with them, which is like, Hey, do you guys have issues in New Jersey with like not enough people who want to be teachers? Like all 50 states, someone in that DOE office is going to say yes, right? Yeah, like, yeah. and like, oh, would it be helpful? Do you guys have trouble processing things like as fast as you'd like? Yes, great. Like <laughs> we can help do that too. Like we, we actually can just be helpful because it serves both us, schools, teachers, candidates, et cetera. And I think that that's like, actually like one of the more fun things that like we've been able to kind of build with Swing. Cool, yeah. So again, solving a, a real pressing problem. Yeah. So we're, we're in early, early June and for about, you know, basically three months now with, with ed tech startup leaders like yourself, I've been just discussing how the, you know, our global context has led to yeah. various decisions. And for you, part of that was launching a new, I guess, product or, you know, area of your business. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting, like tutoring is something that we've thought about for a long time and, and tutoring itself is just like a very competitive space. And like, I, I assume actually, I don't totally know that like all these companies that do tutoring are competing with each other to acquire um, potential customers, to acquire tutors. And, and so for us, we just were like, well, we've actually gone, done really well and grown really quickly doing just this core business of substitute teachers. And it doesn't really make sense to like, kind of pick a fight with all these big hyper competitive companies. And then uh, like COVID-19 hit and schools are shut down. We have resources. We actually have kind of this pool of workers that are perfect for doing tutoring. They're excited to kind of like do work work with students and like we're asking us if there was work that we could provide them and like it's pretty heartbreaking to most of the times so they'll have to say no and so tutoring was just this like great opportunity and there's such an excess of demands that like it made sense that we wouldn't have to compete as hard to get those eyeballs and I think also we have these district relationships which you know it's not it's not like I don't know uh, like it's not like districts are just handing us their parents or anything like that but it is like for us to say, look, these are the substitute teachers that are going into the classrooms that your kids would be in. So try it out. And we've had something where we've done kind of like a buy one hour of tutoring and give one hour to like a district administrator or teacher to help them with managing their own family, kids, whatever. 
Yeah. Yeah. I know just from a couple different experiences and hearing perspectives, part of the challenge of tutoring, at least, you know, I've either seen or heard, not personally experienced from the business perspective is both, you know, churn on the customer side and high turnover on the tutor side. So it seems like you really kind of, by adding it as an additional service on your existing business, help right. to solve both of those problems. Yeah. So it seems like, you know, hope, the hope is that like using this time period to really kickstart that business in a way where it'll, we want it to make sense with the whole business, right? It really seems logically like it does. Mm -hmm. And so the, the key is for us at this point to provide a product and service that people really like. Could you see, get, clearly not to come back to this point, but could you, you know, look thinking ahead a little bit, could you see this also being kind of like swing substitute teachers or, you know, swing offering tutors that help students during the typical school day as well? Yeah. So, I mean, it's something actually, and we'll, we'll see how this plays out as schools open up. But one, I think, again, like once during the school day, I would say when schools open, I mean, look, I, I think seeing schools in other countries open um, already in Europe and in Asia, one thing that's pretty consistent is that it's not 100% attendance. So you open these schools and I, I've seen numbers anywhere from 25% of students showing up to, to 70% um, and 70% is the highest I've seen. And so that's a lot of kids not showing up and, and where my head went to was like, well, how do schools get their budget every year? Cause that's ADA typically, right? And like, if you have 30% of your kids not coming, you kind of want other ways to kind of both capture that. And I mean, like from a less cynical point of view, make sure learning really is still happening for these, these kids. And like, I think tutoring could definitely be a part of that. And I think schools will hopefully be receptive to, again, using teachers that they're already using and feel comfortable with. And, and I think that that's exciting for us too. But there's certainly like, <laughs> there's a lot of unknowns heading into this fall for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For any listeners, Mike and I both have young kids. So one of our kids is making noise somewhere, but I'll, I'll blame it I on I think that me. might be mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, uh, whatever. I'll, I'll take the, whatever, whoever it is. <laughs> um, just makes for better listening, authentic <laughs> listening experience. <Yeah. laughs> so, you know, we, we've been talking about the, uh, basically, you know, and I, this is not how I intended it, but kind of a bunch of points that just make Swing a, I don't know, kind of like a solid business for right now. And others have certainly, you know, acknowledged that and uh, put their money where their mouth is as well. And, and uh, you know, I've, I was just, talking about some of the investment you've gotten from yeah. three that, you know, three, three groups that I noticed and, and correct me if I'm wrong, were uh, Google Ventures, Owl Ventures and, and Social Capital. So I know, again, this is a topic you've, you've t spoke about a little bit before and, you know, it's a, it's a deep topic in the startup world, but I guess just pretty simply, what advice do you have for early stage founders when it comes to fundraising? And, you know, maybe going off of that, what advice do you have about, you know, being a, a good, you know, steward or a good person to implement investment, at, you know, make smart decisions after you get it? I, I mean, both are probably, it's almost like the same. I mean, like, ultimately, the, the like, the stupid advice is really just to say, like, be a good business and demonstrate that it's a good business. I think, I think the, like, biggest, especially, like, earlier stage mistake that I see is that, and, and I think this comes from reading a lot of like TechCrunch articles about companies that get founded or like invested in, in, in big dollars sometimes too, before there's even a product. I, my guess is that almost never happens in education in particular, and that it's actually just pretty rare generally. Most of the time you actually have to be generating revenue before you can raise money. And the articles in the media just don't, don't really like focus there. And so I would really say like, focus on your own business and what you can do without outside investment. And, and like, that's the best thing to do. And it is really hard though. Like a lot of times you don't have a technical co-founder and that's like the most frequent thing that I hear about like why someone feels like they need that outside investment. 
And I don't, I don't necessarily have like a good answer to that other than like, you know, the part of every in particular CEO or founder's job is to basically like be a good, like you hear the, the phrase storyteller and like, that's a part of it. Like, I think storyteller makes it seem a little too fake, but there's some overlap between being a good storyteller and it, it being really, truly authentic. Mm-hmm. And if you can combine those two things, then hopefully you'll be able to not just recruit the right people to come kind of like help build this thing with you, but also, you know, go, go get those investors later too. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, revenue and growth, especially like in the venture capital world are the, the main things that people really care about. Yeah. Yeah. So have a good business and, and communicate it clearly. Why yeah. It's, why it's good. Yeah. Um, And the only thing I would say add on the like steward part that's like separate and maybe this is true in terms of how to get investment too, but like, I don't know. I mean, it's helpful to just be honest. (laughs) Like (laughs) there's a lot fewer things to keep track of if you're just being honest with people anyway. And I I think that they, especially these uh, investors, venture capital investors and and even angel investors in, in Silicon Valley, like, they have so few repercussions after they give you like, or like ways to like control how their money is used. I mean, there's board seats and things like that, but they don't even typically get board control until like pretty late in a company's stage life cycle. And so really they have no way to manage their, like they're really just kind of trusting people with their money. And so I think that that actually also goes a long way. Mm -hmm. So Switching uh, gears a little bit, you you mentioned there about you know one one way that people might spend their money more or less is to find a technical co-founder, but uh, you have a background as a as a software engineer, so it's interesting because I've heard you talk about definitely mentioned sales a few times through our conversation yeah. here, and now but you have the background as as an engineer, so I plan to ask about the engineering background, but now I'm curious about about both. And if you, I get, you know, I'm, I'm always curious. I noticed, you know, founders or CEOs, they they might choose based on their skills, uh, their skill set to lend their time more towards a, a certain area of the yeah. business and delegate other parts or you know hire in other areas faster. And then they also just might have a, you know, do that based on what the company needs or their their what their skill set is. So a long way to to ask. How does the background in engineering affect your your leadership? Yeah, it's funny. I, I had a, like an early conversation with an employee where I kind of like we were I don't remember exactly what the what he was asking me, but th- like the way he asked it actually was sort of like it made me think about what is my like CEO archetype. And I, I think that that's sort of like baked into your question a little bit. Like you have some CEOs that are like sales CEOs and some like engineering CEOs. And I kind of think of some of each, like, like the Zoom CEO, Eric Duan, like definitely like he was CTO at um, WebEx. And so like definitely probably brings this more engineering mindset to it. And then you can think of other like sales oriented CEOs. And I was a software engineer after college for six years, but then had spent five years at Rocket Ship doing technology stuff, but not at all software engineering. And so I couldn't really code actually, by the time we started Swing, we leaned pretty heavily. Maybe this goes against my honesty thing earlier with investors, but we actually believed pretty heavily on the fact that like Miyasha and us were all like technical. We all had computer science backgrounds. I was a software engineer. I think it has helped because I think I've been able to communicate with Oz and our engineering and product teams really well. It certainly helps me know what's possible much faster, but I can really code. Asha and I probably, Asha's probably written a lot more lines of code and she was never a professional software engineer. And so I think I, I've often felt like I don't really fit any of the archetypes of like CEO. I'm not, Asha was better at sales than I was, still is. Asha's way better at engineering than I ever was, even when we worked together as software engineers. And so... I don't know. I think it has, it's made it so that I can kind of dabble in all these different worlds, but it it actually has led me to just like wonder where exactly I should focus my time. I think most people would, without a technical background, it would be much easier to just kind of turn something over 
and then let someone else deal with it. And in some ways, I think it's more difficult to manage engineering, knowing a little bit. Yeah. Right, right. You, you find yourself peering, peering over the shoulder at the, <laughs> the, the code base. Yeah, and, and, and I actually find myself being very empathetic to like the problems that they have, like, and maybe in particular, because I wasn't probably just not that good of a software engineer when I was doing it. I was like, yeah. It is really hard to get stuff done on time. <laughs> like, That's you're funny. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Empathy seems like you have some empathy and humility. Good, good leadership qualities for sure. Uh, one, one thing I've been curious about. This could be a, just a quick answer or even just a pass. But one thing I've been curious about lately, because I know this is something that you know business leaders in the general startup business world discuss often is just influences, resources, and even like, you know, readings, podcasts, people that you feel like you learn from. Could be a, from the from a business perspective, startups in particular, education. What, what are yeah. some people or, or resources or books that you feel like you've learned from as in your, your journey with Swing? Sure. I mean, it it's varied a lot over time. I, even when Oz and I were actually, so Oz and I actually, we went to high school together, but we also worked together for, for about three years out at this company called Factset, a financial software company when we got out of college. And that was like 2004. And Paul Graham, who was one of the co-founders of Y Combinator was like Y Combinator wasn't a thing, but he was writing a lot of essays. I think he probably already sold his company to Yahoo at that point and whatever. And so he was writing these essays about like startups and entrepreneurship and, and Oz and I actually like we read them together. It's not like we sat side by side, but we both read them essay, the essays and like talked about it at work a lot. And so that was certainly like one of the kind of early influences. When we got closer to kind of wanting to start the company, I actually had not done that much. I would call it like startup reading until the person we had, we had another high school friend of ours who I thought actually was going to start the company with us and be CEO. And when he actually kind of dropped out, I literally Googled something along the lines of like how to be a startup CEO. <laughs> and I think that like this book on Amazon came up. Let me find it. It was by this guy. Dan Shapiro, who like has started four or five companies or something. Um, but it's called the Hot, Hot Seat, the Startup CEO Guidebook. And I was like, I think I need that book. I actually read it. It was super useful. I, I like would highly recommend it to anyone actually thinking it was like practical, but also like philosophical in nature. Later, like Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, was like an amazing kind of leadership CEO book. And then I would say once the company kind of like got going a bit more and that definitely coincided with me having two kids since we've started the company. I mean, now I would say most of my like reading and podcasts that I listen to are a lot of them actually have much more to do with like parenting, but that, and it's funny to say, but that empathy of like, how do you, and how do you like empathize with this little person that like just doesn't have the like knowledge or context that you might have. And context in particular is the thing that I think like is true or analogous in the like business leadership world is like, there are certain things that I can't tell everyone at the company all the time. And so when they come to me with a problem, I have to be empathetic to the fact that like, I can't just be dismissive of it because they don't know the context because it's not their job to know the context. And in some cases it's actually not their like right if it's like an HR compliance thing. So, you know, I think, you know, like understand that and say like, I totally get it. If I were you, I'd probably feel the same way too. And yet hopefully you trust me enough to know that like, I hear you and I am still gonna make this other decision that you're telling me right now that you disagree with. And like, hopefully you would by and large feel like if we were, if the roles were reversed and you knew what I knew, that like you could trust that decision or may, might, may, might maybe, if not come to the same decision, at least be much more empathetic for the decision that I'm making. And I found that that is like super important. And so like, I mean, I'll say like, I listen to Janet Lansbury's podcast about parenting like a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like how to be a respectful parent or something like that. It's cool. great. Yeah, yeah. I can definitely echo that sentiment in terms of the, the ability, you know, patience, 
time management, you know, the, yeah. the, the parallels between trying to, you know, work efficiently and well and with others, especially and, and parent are definitely many. Yeah. Let's see. So what a, I had a, you know, we've touched on all different things, some that I had planned on and some that have just, you know, arisen organically a little bit, but there was one thing now that you've mentioned like a potential HR issue that I was curious about. I just saw the line on your website that, that said, you know, just explaining your company, we recruit screen and support thousands of substitute teachers. And that made yeah. me think of, you know, right now I've been really interested in, especially as somebody who's, you know, teaching online and then also doing things like this podcast, other stuff online, having a, having a process and how about, you know, outlining a process and refining it and how that not only saves time, but, but gets better results, makes people feel more comfortable. It's so important. So with the scale at which you've worked with these teachers, I'm wondering about how you maybe how you've developed hiring processes uh, around teachers. Substitute uh, teachers, yeah. Yeah, and if maybe you feel like that is something that's you know bled over into other areas of the business, I'm just curious about your standpoint on business processes in general. Yeah, so <laughs> early on when we started the company, I actually talked to, it was like a, a friend of my wife's, and actually I think it was like, my wife's friend's husband, but he, his job was actually to manage like hard drives or like computers in Google's data centers. And like, he was describing just like the quantity of like computers and saying, you know, hard drives have like a 1% failure rate or something. Like it's something actually that's like really high if you like mm -hmm. think too Scary. hard about it and you get, <laughs> you get worried for your own data and he, he was basically just saying like so like if we have this data center that has you know when google was small like ten thousand computers in it and you literally every year have a hundred like hard drives that die but now it's like a million computers inside a data center and you have a thousand uh lap or hard drives that die every day or ten thousand every year i think it was like you can't, you don't even have enough time to go in and replace them. Like to replace a hard drive, you gotta like pull it out and like, and so his whole thing was like, and, and like I ended up applying this to, I'd say just generally our, our external communication or cu customer communication, which is like so, so many of these things, you just, you want to make anything that you don't have to touch that you don't, you don't touch it. Like if it can be something that somebody like would rather look it up online, uh, use the knowledge base or help desk articles. That's great. But I would certainly not sit here and say that we're in an industry where I would tell someone like, if they ask the question, well, why don't you go look at the thing online? Like I would never say that to somebody. Um, yeah, tough balance. Uh, yeah, or I would try not to. I'm sure, I'm sure someone might hear that and say like, oh, I don't know, Swing Support told me that before. <laughs> it's possible, but it's not the goal. I mean, the goal is really to say like, look, if you want to self-serve, if you're in the 90% that would prefer to self-serve, oftentimes like I'm in that camp when I'm dealing with like a personal vendor issue. Like, I don't really want to call. Like, I'd much rather email, text, chat online. And that's a good thing that saves the company time. It saves me kind of the hassle of having to pick up the phone. And so like, you want to meet people where they're at. And like, as we get bigger, like, and as Google's data centers gotten bigger, like you have to say, okay, like, how are we going to handle 10,000 tickets a day? And like, you have to say, oh, actually like, it's now that much more important to us that the hard drive failure rate is 0.1% and not 1%. And so like, we have to basically move our resources in a way, improve our resources in a way that it's not meeting 90%, but it's meeting 95% of like people's needs without having to call us. And that way for the one to 5% that really do want to talk to us, like we're available for them. And I think again, like education, what I really feel about education is like, it's such a human endeavor. I mean, say what you want about like distance learning or like online curriculum and all that, but like, man, it's all so much better when there's good people involved, um, trying to do the right thing for kids and parents trying to do the right thing for kids and talking to each other with teachers, like, how can we do it better? And so like, you know, we, I think we would love to have 
as many of those interactions as we can and that people want to have. And the real key is to eliminate the time spent doing kind of phone calls or in-person interactions where people don't want it. And if you don't want it, then, then great. Hopefully that's not indicative of any negative things, but like, yeah. That, that would be what I would say, like philosophically, it's like how you get to larger scale without sacrificing, hopefully like providing good kind of relationships. Yeah, yeah. Right. That, and that makes sense. Yeah. I think it's easy to say, yeah, you just look for all of the areas that you can automate, delegate, you know, record. Yep. But you, I like how you're take, you take more of a, you know, a human centered approach to it and decide more what has to be or what really is best served by human interaction and what would people right. prefer to do on their own. That's a, I like that approach for it. Uh, so Mike, I really like the, you know, just, I always say I ask a lot of selfish questions here just because I'm curious to learn from people like you. And I, I definitely have, you know, learned a lot here about your, your business philosophy. Before we go though, I'm just curious, you know, our, our listeners are a mixture of, you know, educators, school leaders, and then also other ed tech business professionals or, or investors. So what is a final maybe suggestion or call to action somewhere that people can go to learn more about, you know, you, your business, whatever you'd like to, to present to them? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say I'll take this opportunity, I guess, to just, and I don't know when this podcast will get released, right? But like, we are in a very particular time right now with the Black Lives Matter movement. And I would honestly just encourage as many people as possible to kind of like do everything they can to understand these issues and empathize with that social justice movement. I got into education because I thought that it was the highest leverage way or was like kind of the key to social equity in, in the country. And I think actually, and like I've learned this, I think along with everybody else is like when cell phone footage comes out and each time like it's the same, which is there's no excuses for these incidents, the brutality, like the killing. And I would really encourage people to kind of like try and learn everything they can about what they can do. Because I think at the end of the day, even education can only go so far as far as like the K-12 system anyways. And that like, there are these, all these other systemic problems um, that are out there that like also need to be fixed if we really want to have the society that like, we, we can have it. Like we built, it's so funny. Like we have this philosophically like a system that should be representative government and right now it actually just doesn't represent our country. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's what I would hope people can go, go take their time doing. Um, and that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I appreciate you articulating that in a, in a definitely a thoughtful, a thoughtful way. And I agree. Education cannot be 100% of the solution, of course, I'd like to think that one other thing that you mentioned, you know, empathy when combined with, you know, learning can, can make, can move things forward at least. Yeah. Um, it definitely can. I, and I don't, I don't want to shortchange education. Education is a very powerful mover in all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I found this actually when I was working at rocket ship is like, wow, like if this thing works, I guess we'll know in like 25 years because we were running elementary schools. And like, I think I just didn't have the patience for that a little bit too. And that was certainly one of the reasons to like move on and start swing. And I kudos to all the people out there in education that do have that faith and patience because I think it really will pay off. But yeah, I think right now there's even more media problems in the world, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, Mike, you know, across education, business, leadership, parenting. We, we touched on a lot here and I, I've personally learned a lot. So I really appreciate you taking the time to, to come on for whether you're a, you know, a, a school leader or maybe somebody, as you mentioned, a, 
what was your term for the early education career people who become involved with swing? edu explorers yeah or maybe you're an edu explorer go check out swingeducation.com to to learn more about what what mike's doing and uh, until next time everybody my name's gerard dawson thanks for listening to the edtech startup show mike thanks so much for coming on thank you